Kia ora and welcome. Uh, thank you for joining me this afternoon. Uh, I'm Nicole. I am the new Otago Regional Coordinator at the New Zealand Land Care Trust. Um, today I'll be pre presenting on the considerations and benefits of writing an environmental plan for your small block. Um, and if you have any questions, uh, please just write them in the chat box and I will answer them towards the end of the presentation. All righty, let's get started. Ooh, why is that not doing that for me? Okay, so why are we here today? Um, so farmers are adapting to some new regulations um, that are centered around freshwater, climate and biodiversity. Um, and the larger blocks are generally quite well supported by industry groups like Beef and Lamb and Dairy and Z. Uh, and they also have some rural professionals that can also assist them. Um, so many of the new regulations won't apply to lifestylers or smaller blocks. And by that, I mean properties that are less than 20 hectares or those that are less than 50 acres, um, if you work in some, some old measurements there. However, um, we definitely believe that it is, they can be a useful tool to assist landowners in looking after and enhancing the biodiversity and freshwater values on their properties. Um, small block holders can have a cumulative effect um, and by working through an environmental plan, it is a good way for, to be able to manage and assess your property's risk. Okay, so today this online webinar will cover why having an environmental plan is beneficial. Um, oh, we'll have a look at um, in creating the environmental plan, how you will critically assess and the risks of your land um, and the way that it is managed. Um, and we'll also run through some of the components of the plan, um, which include looking at the features on your property, um, looking at how you can assess that risk, um, gaining some knowledge on good management practices, and then um, putting together a really good action plan for the next steps. So hopefully um, you have all received a template, which I emailed out to you yesterday. So I'll be referencing that throughout the webinar um, and you can begin filling that template out after today's presentation. All right, so a farm environment plan is a tool that can help you recognize environmental risks and set out a program of actions to manage those risks, to minimize and manage the impact of the land, the way we use our land, on the ecosystem. So this is inclusive of the soil, the freshwater, and the biodiversity. So just be aware that farm environmental plans or small block environmental plans um, can take all forms. Um, they can be a hard copy or they can be digital. The main thing is to just remember to keep it as a living document, um, ensuring that it is updated to reflect the implementation of your actions um, to add any newly identified risks and to keep um, it live with your future plans. So once again, have we look at the template that we sent you. There's no need to fill it out now, but as I walk you through this presentation, um, it's important to first make sure you acknowledge what you already know and do well on your property. Um, and also to assess what practices could be improved on um, and how you can go about doing that. Alrighty, so no document is complete without some details and context, so it's pretty important to include some things like your personal information, um, perhaps a description of what you're doing on your property, um, and there might be a little bit of history that goes with it. Um, and it can be quite cool to include some photos as well, so um, these are really good for documenting progress um, and changes, so um, you might want to photograph it um, now, and then as you work through your actions, um, you'll be able to see progress um, from year to year, perhaps. All right, um, and from the outset, it's also really nice to have a think about some goals that you may have for your property. So um, these goals could be short, medium, or long-term, um, and they can be added now if you have some in mind, or you can um, have a wee think about them after you've completed the land use and environmental risk assessment. So in identifying goals for your property, this will help you with your action plan. 
Um, a goal could be, for example, um, to reduce bank erosion to the waterway or um, reduce pugging over winter. But it's really important that goals, to remember that goals are outcome based. Um, so they can be really broad um, and they also may require several actions to actually achieve the goal. So going back to that example, reducing pugging over winter, you might need many actions to achieve that. Um, and you also may want to think about um, conversing with your neighbours or other people within your catchment um, to see if you've got some similar goals, as there might be opportunities um, to work together. All right, so a map is a fairly essential part of your plan. Um, you'll hear me referring back to, you know, maybe you should map that as I go through this presentation. Um, so you can make your mapping as complex or as simple as you have the, the ability. Um, you can simply hand draw some features over an aerial map, or you could utilize some online uh, GIS tools. Um, and just to note there that uh, the New Zealand Land Care Trust has done a webinar on some of the options for those freely available GIS tools that are online. So you can be sure to check that out. Um, so you might want to map some features on your property. Um, so you might want to think about um, access, um, some native vegetation, we've got some infrastructure like laneways or bridges. Um, and you also might, to, might like to mark um, areas like critical source areas that require the careful management. Now we'll talk about critical source areas in just a couple of slides times. Um, all righty. So um, it's also really important to note what you already do on your property. Um, this way, uh, what you need to do will be sort of naturally highlighted um, and it will help inform those actions. So to assist with this, you will see some assessment points in the template that was emailed um, that you can work through. And I find it quite helpful to try and look at your property through someone else's eyes. So try and have a think about what would someone else see? Um, in my experience, if something looks bad to someone else's eye, you know, it's likely that there is room for improvement and that's really good. We can come back and address this with some action points. Okay, so to start with, we will have a look at these critical source areas. So these are areas on your property which are high risk of losing contaminants. So by identifying them and coming up with some mitigation options, um, we can put those in place and reduce any risk in the receiving environment, i.e. waterways. So critical source areas are the areas of your land that are prone to surface runoff. Um, and with that surface runoff, nutrients, and sediment um, and also bacteria can be accumulated and enter waterways um, as they are typically areas that lead to a drain, a stream, um, but they could be gullies, swales or wetlands and that kind of thing. So to have a wee look at our images, on the left we're looking at kind of a flow path where water is naturally collecting. So that's our critical source area. On the right, we're looking at an area where stock cross, and I think it's fairly obvious, um, but the critical source area is there, um, and perhaps down the track, you could have an action that you might want to install a culvert, for example, to mitigate that area. Okay, so runoff from critical source areas impacts the ecosystem health in numerous ways. The degree of the impact can be different between properties due to the underlying geology, different um, differences in the climate, um, and also the predominant land use or the land use intensity. So the impacts on the ecosystem can include sedimentation, which can decrease the water quality, um, and sediment can also damage the fish, the, the gills of fish um, and invertebrates. Nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus phosphorus and excess can lead to nuisance growth of plants and algae um, and in extreme concentrations they can be quite toxic both to aquatic animals and also to humans as well. And bacteria like E. coli and waterways indicate the presence of fecal matter. 
So this can suggest the presence of other harmful bacteria as well. So it's really important to retain the nutrients and topsoil on the land and treat them as assets. Okay, so identifying your critical source areas. Do you know where all the areas are on your property? Um, they're often areas in the paddock that take a while to dry out, um, or it could be that area of the laneway that could really do with a culvert. So um, I really encourage you to walk your property um, and have a map with you and draw it on it where the critical source areas are. So where does the water flow? You know, that could risk carrying the fecal contaminants. Where does the water pull? Um, and uh, where are your areas of sediment loss? So where there's bare earth, um, potentially a weather event like rain um, and a bit of slope, i.e. the pathway, um, you're likely to lose some soil and result in sedimentation. So the next concept that I wish to introduce you to is that of good management practices. Um, so I'm going to run through a series of these and it's quite likely that you're already doing a lot of these on your property, but you just may not have them sort of written down in a plan, or you may not even recognise that they're good management practices. Um, but good management practices are agreed uh, techniques that help mitigate various land management or land use practices. Um, so as you go through the process of creating your action plan, these good management practices become your go-to toolbox um, to mitigate the risks and achieve your property goals. So in this webinar today, um, we're going to stick to some GMPs that will assist with the key areas of risk. Um, that's quite a long list, um, but there are more, um, and we will just sort of highlight the key points for each of these. Um, and of course, not all of them may be relevant to your property, but this will give you a good overview. Uh, so for more information on these good management practices, um, you can refer to Appendix 1 of the template, um, where we've linked some good resources that will help. So to start with, um, if you've got stock, you are probably familiar with production and animal welfare considerations for managing the stock. Um, but stock can also have an environmental impact, which can also be managed. So uh, it is important that you have appropriate stocking rates for the, your property. So the environmental implement, implications of a property which is overstocked can include the loss of contaminants to waterways, can also result in compacted soil or the pugging of soil. Um, it's also important to ensure that stock are excluded from waterways, drains and wetlands. Um, ideally, that would be roughly a three metre setback at a minimum uh, from a waterway. And you could do this either with a permanent fence or you could use a temporary measure um, just when the weather conditions or the stocking rate requires it. Um, it's important to ensure that stock have access to alternative water sources other than natural water. So providing an alternative like a trough um, ideally in every paddock uh, as an alternative to um, waterways, streams, that kind of thing. Um, and it's also important to think about the rotation of your stock. Um, for example, you could consider grazing the wetter paddocks on your property earlier in the winter um, and then leave the stock off them to just minimise that amount of pugging. Oh dear, you haven't received the template there, Hannah. That's okay. I'll make a note to, um, to make sure that it's sent to you. Not a problem. Uh, so in terms of cultivation and cropping management practices, um, if you are looking to renew pasture or plant a crop for next winter, there are a few considerations to keep in mind. Um, and this starts right back um, as early as possible with paddock selection. So um, with paddock selection, you may want to factor in the steepness of the paddock, um, or also um, maybe you've got paddocks that have got multiple waterways that run through them, um, and they may not be ideal for cropping um, or wintering your stock on. So you could mark those paddocks which should not be cultivated or wintered on on your map that could be within your environmental plan. Um, 
Now, whether you're doing the cultivation of a paddock yourself, or you also could be getting a contractor in, um, it is important that a grass buffer is left around waterways um, and that CSAs, those critical source areas, are left in grass as well, as that helps trap sediment from the disturbed land. Um, if you are using a contractor, it might be quite good to talk them through some of these concepts and just request um, that these buffers are left. Make sure they have lots of information. Um, you can reduce the erosion potential of weather events like thunderstorms um, by cultivating along the contours rather than up and down the slope. That just means that the water doesn't create lots of runs in the paddock. And just remember that wherever there is bare soil, there is a risk of sediment runoff or wind erosion. So by ensuring that the soil is armoured with vegetation, and by that I mean that there's sort of a living root in the ground, um, and that you limit the amount of time that the soil exposed, that reduces the risk of that erosion or runoff. And maintaining good soil structure does assist with increasing the permeability um, which then reduces the amount of runoff that occurs during rainfalls. Okay, so um, if you are looking to use fertilizer on your property, uh, prior to applying it, it is recommended that you test your soil to see what nutrients are deficient. Uh, any excess nutrients um, can leak from the soil, which is simply just a waste of resource and time and money, but um, it can also potentially affect uh, nearby water quality. Um, in terms of the timing of your application, check the forecast before applying. Um, and just remember that a little bit applied more often is much more effective than a one-off heavy application of fertilizer. Um, fertilizer should also not be applied within five meters of any waterway. Um, and you should also try and avoid applying it to any gullies. Um, and lastly, keep a record of where you've been applying the fertilizer and how much you've been applying to your property. It's just a really good habit to get into. So hopefully once you've got that crop in and you've got a good strike rate and it's grown well, um, you're looking to do some winter grazing um, to get your stock through. So this once again, starts with selecting the paddocks really carefully um, and implementing those buffers around waterways and critical source areas. So some other strategies um, can include um, having a plan. You can have a grazing plan. Um, and this grazing plan could consider what you will do to manage your stock during adverse weather conditions um, and how you will manage those stock movements. Um, you might want to be within that plan thinking about where you want to exclude your stock from, for example, wet areas. Um, you might want to think about back fencing as you shift the stock onto a new break, um, putting a temporary fence up just to reduce pugging. Um, and once the crop has been grazed, you might want to think about planting a catch crop. Um, now, catch crop is sort of a secondary crop. Um, you could be planting something like oats or barley, for example. And this protects the bare soil, gets that living root back in the ground, um, which assists with soaking up excess nutrients. Now, Beef and Lamb have provided a really good webinar on grazing, on winter grazing. Um, so refer to your template where we've got a link for that one. Um, and they can also provide a good template for a grazing plan um, if you use crop to winter your stock. Okay, hill erosion um, is an issue in some parts of Otago. Um, so good management practices for erosion prevention means maintaining good cover of pasture and trying to avoid any overgrazing. Uh, it also includes um, really carefully thinking about where you're putting your tracks and the layout of those tracks. Um, we recognise that sediment loss may be inevitable, uh, so you may want to think about adding some cutouts to your tracks um, ensuring that it's got um, culverts where they are required and um, maybe having sort of a sediment trap or something like that to slow down that water um, and cut back on that erosion. Uh, you could also think about using some conservation plantings, either native or exotic trees, um, which will assist with stabilizing any erosion prone land. Uh, in terms of stream erosion um, good management practices. 
Excluding stock, once again, is quite key. Um, so you want to minimise the damage that they can do to the stream banks um, and encourage vegetation along the stream margin to reduce their erosion. Um, there are a few options for preventing or reducing stream bank erosion. Um, one of these is using hard engineering. Um, so this means like using structures or rock walls um, or even reshaping banks. Um, this is quite serious stuff. Uh, so don't go doing any hard engineering um, without perhaps having a good conversation with the Otago Regional Council. Um, it is possible that you may need a resource consent. Uh, the alternative is using some soft engineering tools. So this could be like using plants to buffer the bank. Um, these plants could be native, um, or you could also be incorporating some poplars or willows in the right places, in the right species. Um, you just need to make sure with plantings that you are accounting for the maintenance that will be required. Um, and also have we think about the lifespan of poplars and willows um, as well. So you can identify wetland areas on your property. Um, these could be streams, they could be seeps, they could be obvious wetlands, um, even gullies. Uh, so it would be good to prioritise fencing these areas, if you've got stock on the property, of course, um, as excluding stock can reduce the direct input of contaminants to those areas. Um, just be aware that um, when you're putting fencing up in these areas, you may need to once again consider adding culverts or bridges um, if you're looking to cross waterways. Um, once again, check with the Otago Regional Council uh, as the intended work may or may not be permitted. Um, so it could need a resource consent if you're looking at bridges or culverts. Um, and then once you've got the fencing up, I guess your next priority there is thinking about some planting. Uh, so you can start by just leaving it as rank grass, which absolutely filters contaminants. Um, but without that stock grazing pressure, you will need to start thinking about some weed control. Um, or in an ideal world, you would have a lovely plan um, which incorporates some native species. Okay, so you may be lucky enough to have some bush blocks or wetlands on your property. Um, or you may want to create them from scratch, like a constructed wetland or something like that. Um, once again, it's good to fence these off um, if you've got stock. Um, the stock will tend to graze on the seedlings, so that will impede natural regeneration. Um, and they can, stock can also impact soils um, and hydrology by the pugging and compaction of the soil. Um, you'll need to once again think about that weed control. Um, and you can see if there is a possibility to connect remnant areas um, of bush. Um, and just remember that wetlands and wetted areas um, could be subject to council rules. So if you want to get in there and start altering it, um, you might want to have a good conversation with council once again. Okay, infrastructure, um, we've talked a little bit about this as we've gone along, but it can be a big source of pollutants um, and sediment. So we've covered the need for tracks to have good camber um, and also to have regular cutouts and drainage. Um, thinking about the installation of bridges and culverts where, they, where a track goes through a waterway. Um, thinking about alternatives to natural water for stock. So once again, hopefully sort of a minimum of a trough per paddock. Um, and also, if you've got a septic system for your house, um, ensure that it's maintained and fit for purpose, um, as these can also um, result in a release of pathogens and nutrients to streams and groundwater. Okay, so that's the end of all those good management practices. Um, as I say, that was quite a high level. Um, there's definitely more information to be found on each of those out there. Um, but it, once, since you've now got a bit of an overview, um, you could start assessing your property against those relevant good management practices. Of course, this will then help lead you into the action plan. 
Okay, and once you've assessed your current practices um, and you've had to think about where those critical source areas might be, uh, a risk analysis may help with narrowing in on your priorities. So to complete an environmental risk analysis for your various practices, um, you can start by asking, what is the likelihood of an impact occurring? Then start considering the scale of the impact. And then at the intersection of the likelihood and the impact is the environmental risk of that land management or land use practice or the risk that could result from management of that critical source area. Once you've completed the risk assessment for your property, you can start by identifying the actions that need to be done. Uh, your action plan is the nuts and bolts of your environmental plan. Um, so try to have actions that are achievable in a certain time frame. Um, and some of these actions could be broken down into manageable bites. Um, and you could have a more in-depth plan behind it. For example, riparian planting, you might want to think about doing that in some stages and really plan for the maintenance and other requirements like weed or pest control. Try and prioritise the actions so that you don't feel too overwhelmed. Um, yep, ideally critical source areas and practices with high environmental risks should be a higher priority. But in reality, actions chosen and their priority is a personal choice. And that could be based on your available time, your available finances, or some other driver. Um, and as you can see by this example in this table, um, the cost and time frame are both estimates. Um, and this just helps with the prioritization process. Um, it's certainly not set in stone facts. Um, so you might want to come back to that once you've got some quotes and that kind of thing. Okay, that pretty much brings us to the end of this overview. Uh, today we've briefly covered some of the key concepts needed for writing an environmental plan. Um, and now it's important that you take what you have learned and apply it to your property. Um, so, you know, in particular, you can start with completing that property map. Um, think about some goals, get them written down on paper, it's always a good start, and then start working through that assessment. Uh, further help is available. Um, the New Zealand Land Care Trust has a great selection of resources on our website, so be sure to check those out. Um, if you have a slightly larger property, over 20 hectares, contact your industry group. Um, and also think about utilising neighbours or experts within your catchment. Um, get in touch with the Otago Regional Council or feel free to get in touch with me as well. So that brings me to the end of the presentation, um, but I do welcome any questions that you may have. Um, just feel free to put those questions into the chat box. Um, but while you do that, um, I invite you to contact me uh, if you have um, a group of small block holders or neighbours um, or just a number of small block holders within your catchment that would be interested in attending um, an in-person webinar, um, uh, not sorry, an in-person workshop. Um, so that would be an extension of this webinar. Um, so if there is demand in a particular area of Otago, uh, I'm happy to arrange for that in-person workshop. So now, any questions? anything that wasn't super clear or any other questions that you might have? Um, of course, you can always just email any questions you have um, for me. Uh, and yeah, um, also, I welcome any feedback or comments. Um, just feel free to email me. I've got my email there on that slide. Um, but yeah, if, that's, uh, if there's no further questions, I um, really appreciate you spending your lunch break with me. Oh, here's some questions. This is good. So at times it can be hard to find out about permits um, with the ORC. Um, can you contact me for advice? Um, absolutely, I'm happy for you to come to me. Um, and I can see if I can find the right person within the regional council that can give you the information, can certainly help put, point you in the right direction and see if I can get that um, clarity. Uh, there's another question there around fencing 
off man-made water features? Uh, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, ideally, you want to keep your stock out of man-made water features as well, because um, that can affect groundwater, um, groundwater quality. Uh, but provided that it is a man-made water feature, um, I would just have a think about where does the um, where what's the potential for that feature that water feature to spill over? What impact can it have downstream, um, even if it was to overtop or something like that? So, yeah, um, bit of a personal choice as well. But yeah, certainly happy to send some photos through, and I'll I'll try and help you out with that one. Um, so Annie, you've got a question there around um, running a session in a catchment with large and small farmers. Um, ideally, uh, it would be with lifestylers. Um, there is a few regulations with regular farmers, but um, I could consider that on a sort of case-by-case -case basis. So get in touch with me, Anna, and we'll have a wee think about that. Um, Southland small block holders, Gavin. Um, I am not as across Southland as Otago. Um, so nothing specific comes to mind, um, but yeah, I just encourage that you get in contact with Environment Southland um, and they might have some more information um, specific for that Southland context. Awesome. Um, so you're finding it a wee bit tricky to navigate the Regional Council website. Um, uh, I'm just not sure, Jeanette, um, what information that you're looking for on the website um, for the Otago Regional Council. So maybe if you want to send me an email, um, I'll see if I can help fill in the gaps for you there. Um, awesome. Okay, well, that's a great range of questions. Thank you very much. Um, and I think I will bring that to a close for now. So thank you very much, everybody, for your time. Um, and once again, please get in touch uh, if you've got any further questions. Thank you.